Hello family. This is our video for two-way tables. I just want to warn you before we get started that I might have to pause um, for students to come in and get work and take quizzes, so I apologize in advance if I need to do that. To keep um, our packets organized, I've been writing the date and the period on my packets. And I've also been numbering them. This would be number five. If you've been numbering them with me, this packet would be number five. This single sheet on misleading graphs would be or is number four. And I think I'm going to move that to the top right like the other ones. What we have done so far uh, in this unit is talk about the different types of data, categorical and quantitative. Then we moved into the ways that we can visually represent categorical data. So we now know that we can represent categorical data with a bar chart or a bar graph, and we can represent it with a pie chart or pie graph. Uh, the next time you have class, you'll be taking quiz two, and quiz two is on um, this packet. Uh, so after this, after we talked about the graphs, we talked about the ways that you could have a, meet, a misleading graph. Uh, and now we're moving into two-way tables. So two-way tables technically aren't a graph. They're a table. You can think about them as a graph and you can refer to them as a graph, but really they're two-way tables. That's why we did misleading graphs before we did this because I wanted it all to go in an order that makes sense. So we've talked about the types of data, data, sorry, the two ways that you can graph categorical data, um, how you can misrepresent that data by graphing it in certain ways, and now we're talking about the um, last way that we can organize categorical data. And that is with a two-way table. I love two-way tables. I think that they're one of the most interesting things in statistics, not only because they give us a lot of information, but they give us a lot of what I think is interesting information. So uh, let's just jump right in and see what's up with these two-way tables. So a two-way table organizes data about two categorical variables, hence the name two-way table. We want to get in the habit of identifying the two different categorical variables in the table. So I usually start uh, by looking at the top part of the table. So we're going to call this categorical variable type of car. And the two types that we have are an SUV, and a sports car. Notice they're both described using words. My second categorical data, I'm going to look at the side, the left-hand side. That's described using the words male and female, so this categorical variable is gender. So we are looking at the types of cars that each gender Buys. So we're looking at males and females and how many of them buy a SUV um, in comparison to how many buy a sports car. Now I'm going to go through um, kind of in depth and show you how to get the missing totals here. So these, um, or I shouldn't say missing totals, how to get the missing values. This column here should add to 240. So if I take one, sorry, 240, subtract 180, that's going to give me 60. So 60 plus 180 equals 240. Same down here, 156 plus 84 equals 240. Well, all of the rows and columns work that way. So that means that 39 plus this missing number should equal 60. So 60 minus 39 is going to give us 21. And now what this information is telling us is uh, we looked at 60 males, 39 of them bought a sports car or drove a sports car, 
21 of them drive an SUV. This means, or is telling us, we looked at 180 females. I wonder why we looked at so many more females than males. And we don't know the different categories yet, so we have to find those. Well, these two things are supposed to add to 84. So once again, we just do 84 minus 39. That gives us 45. So now I know 45 females drive a sports car. 45 of these, 180. Then to find this missing cell, you can either do 156 minus 21 or 180 minus 45. I'm going to do 180 minus 45, and that gives me 135. So what I know right now about this table is that I looked at a total of 240 people. Of those people, 180 were female and 60 were male. I can break that down even further to say of the males, 21 drive an SUV and 39 drive a sports car. Similarly, we can do that for the females. Out of the 180 females, 45 drove a sports car and 135 drove an SUV. So now that we kind of know what this table is telling us and what this information is about, let's see if we can figure out what our explanatory variable is. So our explanatory variable is the variable that best influences or describes or predicts the other variable. So typically when we're looking at two categorical variables, we're looking about we're looking at how are they related? Is there a relationship between these two categorical variables? So I want to say that one more time. When we look at two different categorical variables, most of the time, the reason that we're doing that is because we think that those two variables have some kind of relationship. One of them will be the explanatory variable. That's the one that we think influences the other. So we ask ourselves, do we think that the gender is going to influence the type of car driven? Or do we think that the type of car driven is going to influence the gender? So let's think about that. Do we think that gender is going to predict what type of car you buy? Or do, do you think if I go and buy a, sp a sports car, that's going to influence my gender to become male? Well, hopefully you're thinking that's ridiculous. There's no way that your type of car is going to influence your gender. So the explanatory variable here is gender. We think that there is going to be or is a relationship between your gender and whether or not you drive an SUV or a sports car. Let's think about why that might be the case. When we're talking about an SUV, maybe especially in relation to females, I'm thinking of an SUV like a minivan. It would make sense to me that more females would drive a minivan or a big Suburban or a big, I don't know what other, the other big cars are. Um, why do you think that would be? Why do you think more females would drive an SUV type car? Hopefully you're thinking because maybe they're driving all their kids around everywhere. So um, I think traditionally females are expected to be stay-at-home moms or be the ones that drive the kids everywhere. And so if they have more than one kid, they're probably going to need a larger vehicle like an SUV. If we look at then what the relationship would be between a male and the car, I think that it does make sense that um, males are probably more likely to be driving a Maserati than a female is, especially if that female has kids or whatever else. So we're thinking that females are probably more likely to drive an SUV, and that's because um, they might have kids that they need to chauffeur around. And we're thinking that males might be more likely to drive a sports car because I think men sometimes are more inclined to drive around really cool cars. So I think that this relationship makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense to you. 
in this table to show that we understand the relationship, we're going to get in the practice of drawing an arrow that is a visual representation of that relationship. So we think that the gender is going to influence the type of car. So we would draw our arrow so that it starts at gender and comes around to the type of car. This arrow in a future um, video is going to help us out quite a bit in making a graph out of this information. So we are starting at the explanatory. We wrap our arrow around to what variable we think it influences. So it is important to understand what a two-way table is telling us. We want to get in the habit of identifying what the two variables are. And then one of the most important things about a two-way table is being able to identify which variable is the explanatory and then do a little visual aid here to show that we understand that. So now that we know the basics of a two-way table, let's move on to um, a problem, an application problem, where we can pull information from a two-way table. So this data is about a large national bank. A large national bank determines if each of its branches is profitable or not profitable. So that means either it makes money, you are making more than you spend, or it's not profitable, meaning you're only making what it costs to run the bank or you're making less than what it costs to run the bank. Additionally, the location of each branch is classified as urban, suburban, or rural. So let's uh, quickly identify what these different types are. So urban, hopefully you're thinking city. Suburban is where a lot of us live. Um, we live in the suburbs, meaning there we live where there's a lot of houses and we live in a house and we have houses next to our house. A rural location is more like a farm. There's lots of land, you're separated where you live is separated from the next person with lots of land. Let's think about why they would separate their uh, types of location this way. If we're talking about a city, uh, we're talking about something like downtown Salt Lake where there are lots of apartment buildings and those apartment buildings have 20, 30, 40 stories, and you can fit an apartment building on every single block. So when we look at an urban type of location, there's going to be lots of people within that location because, well, partly because of the way that the housing is. If we're looking at a suburban location, there's not going to be as many people because we're spread out farther. In my neighborhood, there's probably the same amount of people that live in one apartment building on one block in a city. But in the, what is it called, suburbs, it would take five blocks to fit in the same amount of people because our houses are so big. So cities are going to have the most people, suburbs are going to have an, a medium amount of people, and then rural locations are going to have the least amount of people because remember, you're separated from your neighbor by a lot of space, a lot of land. So we have three different um, location types and we have we're looking at whether or not those location types are profitable, meaning we're making money off of them, or not profitable, meaning we're either losing money or just breaking even. A summary of the profitability and type of location of a random sample of 175 of the bank's branches is shown in the table. So they just gave us the two um, categorical variables, so I'm going to highlight that. We have a summary of the profitability, that's our first, or one of them, and location type is the other one. So profitability and location type. 
So now I can come over here and look at my table and identify where that information is. So my profitability is across the top. I usually just write that one down first. So my categorical variable one is profitability. Then my different location type is on the left-hand side. I usually write that as my second variable. So categorical variable two is location type. So I'm going to fill in some um, numbers on the table just to make sure that I understand what this table is telling me. So we looked at 175 different banks. Um, of the ones, of the 175, 64 plus 17 were in an urban location. So 81 of the banks that we looked at were in a city. 39 plus 22, 61 of the banks that we looked at were in a suburb. And then lastly, 33 of the banks that we looked at were in a rural location. And that makes sense. Notice that where you have the most people, you have the most branches. The medium amount of people, you have a medium amount of branches. And then the least amount is in the rural locations where you have the least amount of people. Of this 33, um, rural locations, 18 of those are profitable and 15 are not profitable. Now you're not required to go through and do that, but I do think it's helpful in understanding what information you're getting. It's as I think it's especially helpful when we now answer this question. What would be the explanatory variable in this case? Do we think the location is going to influence whether or not the bank is profitable? Or do we think the profitability of the bank is going to influence the type of location? Well, just because we put a profitable bank in an area doesn't mean that that is going to change the type of area that it is. It's like gender. Um, typically, when you're born biologically, you have one gender. It, location type is the same. That doesn't necessarily change because of outside factors. So you hopefully you are thinking that the explanatory variable in this case is the location type. So essentially what we're saying is we think the type of location that the bank is in is going to influence whether or not it is profitable. And now I'm going to draw that visual aid, that arrow to help me. I think this time I'm going to highlight it just to really make sure that I'm making a big point of that. This um, explanatory variable makes sense to me. It would make sense to me that the banks where there are a lot of people, like a city, are going to be more profitable because you're going to have more customers. Whereas in a rural location, I don't know how profitable they would be because you're serving less customers than you would be in a city. So we think that the uh, type of location is going to affect the profitability. And I personally think that that's the case because the amount of people in the location is what is going to affect your profitability. And there's more people in an urban location than a rural location. Okay, now we're actually going to go through and calculate some proportions or some percents. So what proportion, remember that is just fancy word for fraction, what proportion of branches are profitable? So I did not calculate those totals. They want to know out of the 175 banks that they looked at, how many were profitable? Well, that means we have to go through and add the number that were. There were 64 urban, 39 suburban, 
18 rural. My calculator's not on. Way to go, teacher. That's 121. So of the 175 branches, 121 of those are profitable. I am going to convert that to a percent now. Remember, if that's something you struggle with, there is a video on that that hopefully will help. I get 0.691, so that means this is about 69%. Okay, next question. What proportion of the branches from an urban location are profitable? So what they want to know is of the 81 urban locations, how many are profitable? That means that when you go to make your fraction or your proportion, you put the number of urban locations in the bottom, so 81, and the number that were profitable in the top. So urban 64 were profitable. So out of the 81 urban locations, 64 were profitable. We change that to a percent, 64 divided by 81 we get 0 0.790, so that is 79%. And now what this information is telling us is that overall, 69% of their branches are profitable, but a lot of the profitable locations are in the rural area. Or actually, I should say that a different way. 79% of the um, locations in an urban setting are profitable. And that's higher than overall, the overall um, picture for the bank. So that's telling me that, okay, maybe, maybe there is a relationship there. Maybe because a lot of people live in an urban location, it's making it so a bigger percent of these banks are profitable than overall. The next one says, what proportion of branches from a rural location are profitable? So this time we're changing our bottom to the total number of rural locations and our top to the profitable ones in that area. So there were 33 total rural locations and of those, 18 are profitable. If we do 18 divided by 33, that gives us 5, 4 repeating. Well, 5, 4, 5 repeating. So we're going to round that up to 55. And notice um, the prediction or the relationship that I thought might exist. We can see that here. So overall for the bank, 69% of its locations are profitable. But if we go in and look specifically at the different areas, the urban locations have a higher percent than overall, and the rural locations have a lower percent than overall. And I'm saying I think that that's because there are a lot of people in an urban location, but less people in a rural location. So I personally think that that's a ton of information in one problem. I feel like this tells us quite a bit about this situation. Okay, last up for this lesson is question two. So the following data were collected from a sample of people on their favorite types of leisure activities and their age. The results are shown in the two-way table. What proportion of people aged 7 to 18 years gave watching television as their favorite type of leisure activity? So the first thing that I want you to do is see if you can come up with variable 1, variable 2, and the explanatory variable. So pause the video, really see if you can identify what these are, then unpause and see if you're right.
Okay, hopefully you paused. Um, the variable across the top is favorite type of leisure activity. I probably should have written favorite type of leisure activity, but that's so long I took a shortcut. Down the side is the different age groups. The explanatory variable is age. It does make sense to me that the age you are is going to um, influence maybe what your favorite uh, activity is. Like if you're zero to six years old, I don't know how much you're going to love to read. And some of those kids probably can't even read. Um, if you're greater than 19 years old, maybe if you don't like to read for fun, well, no, that doesn't make sense. If you're 19 years or greater, maybe you don't spend your time anymore playing video games. Maybe you've chosen to do something else. So it does make sense to me that your age would influence what you do. It does not make sense to me that if I play video games, all of a sudden that makes me 13 years old. That it doesn't work the other way. Your age is your age and it doesn't change based off of outside factors. Okay, so this is asking what proportion of people age seven to 18, so I'm gonna highlight that. We're looking at people aged seven to 18 gave watching television as their favorite leisure activity. So that means that seven to 18 is our bottom of the people seven to 18 years and TV is our top. So now you pause it and go through and see if you can do this problem without me. Really pause because I'm going to be working it out in this video. And you rob yourself of a really important opportunity if you just let me do the problem for you. Okay, hopefully you really paused. So they're combining two different categories here. They want us to look at 7 to 18, which means that we need to pull the total amount of people in both of those categories, 7 to 12 and 13 to 18. So we need to take 900 and add it to 1,300. That's similar for the top. We need to, oh, teacher, did I highlight the right column? No, no, I did not. This is what I needed to highlight. Watching TV, that's 200 plus 100. That's going to be 300 over 2100 for a percent of 14. So 14% of people aged 7 to 18 years old prefer to watch TV. I will zoom out now. So this video took a little bit longer than anticipated, but the rest of this uh, lesson is based around two-way tables. So it is really important that we have a strong foundation and a strong understanding of two-way tables. If you have any questions about this video, remember um, that you can always email me and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, I'll see you in the next one. You got three more to go.